Hi there, I'm Karen Davis from Texas. I'm here to talk to you today about a study in genetics and statistics. I'm sure in previous studies you've heard of Gregor Mendel. Gregor Mendel was an Austrian monk who studied genetics of pea plants in his garden. He was fortunate to pick pea plants because pea plants had several different opposing traits, such as purple flowers and white flowers, tall plants and short plants, green pads and yellow pods. Mendel decided he would try to cross plants, breed plants, with opposing characteristics, so tall plants times short plants, for example. To his surprise, all of the offspring from that first generation of plants were tall. So the parental generation produced an F1, or first filial generation, that only showed one of the two phenotypes. The other seemed to have disappeared. Curiously, he decided to cross the F1 generation times itself. And what he discovered was, in a three to one ratio, reliably, the tall or the dominant form would show up over the short or the recessive form. Since then, we've determined that those traits are controlled by genetics and by genes on our chromosomes. And we can follow the movement of those genes by using things like Punnett squares. I'm going to show you how to do a Punnett square and follow that with calculations to see whether or not our predictions for our results will be the same as what we have predicted. So what I have is an ear of corn. In corn, purple is for kernels is dominant over yellow. And smooth is dominant over wrinkled. So some of these will appear smooth and some of them will appear wrinkled due to the amount of starch. If they are smooth, it means they have a lot of starch. If they are wrinkled, it means they have a lot of sugar stored in them. So in these corn, you can see, and I left it in the plastic because otherwise rodents will get on your corn. I'll explain what to do with the corn in just a moment. But when we started, we had originally in our parental generation, a purebred purple and purebred smooth times a purebred yellow and purebred wrinkled. As you can see from these two parents, the only gene that this parent can pass is the capital P for purple. The only gene that this parent can pass is a little p for yellow. For smooth and wrinkled, the only thing that this parent can pass is a capital S for smooth, and the only thing this parent can pass is a small s for wrinkled. So our F1s, if I take my F1s, are going to be big P, little p, big S, little s, and I'm going to cross it times another like itself. So big P, little p, big S, little s. That will be our F1 cross. In our F1 cross, we need to set up our double Punnett square. This is for 16 squares to show two traits being carried at the same time. I like to think of this like in algebra where you do the FOIL. If you remember multiplying in algebra with, with polynomials, you will use first, outer, inner, last. So I do the first P with the first S, and that goes up here. I do the outer P with the outer S, and that goes here. I do the inner P with the out inner S, and that goes there. And then the last P with the last S would go here. Kind of an easy way to remember how to set it up. Since the other parent is exactly the same, we're going to write the same thing on this side. Notice they get a gene for the color and a gene for the shape of the kernel at the same time. So every square will have, when I fill it out, two genes for color and two genes for shape of the, of the kernel. I'm sure you don't want to sit and watch me do this over and over again. So by the magic of television, as I bring one down and I move the other across, just to remember how to do your Punnett squares, 
I will pull my P down and my P across. I like to write the P's together and the S's together. So the first square will look like this. Two big P's, two big S's. My paper wants to move. Through the magic of television, I can pop this up there because you don't want to watch me complete the whole square. And my results would be like this. With my first square, purple and smooth. Counting them out, I have another purple and smooth, another purple and smooth, another purple and smooth, purple and smooth. This one is purple with wrinkles. Purple and smooth, another purple with wrinkles. Purple with smooth, purple with smooth, yellow with smooth this time. Yellow with smooth, purple with smooth, purple with wrinkled again. Yellow with smooth, yellow with wrinkled. When I count them up, I find that I will have nine that are purple and smooth, three that are purple and wrinkled, three that are yellow and smooth, and one that is yellow and wrinkled. That still maintains the three to one ratio of purple to yellow and wrinkled or smooth to wrinkled. Taking this information, that's going to help me make a prediction as to how many ears, or how many kernels, I'm sorry, on the ear of corn should be purple and smooth. That should be nine sixteenths of these kernels. Purple and smooth should be three sixteenths of these kernels. Yellow and smooth should be three sixteenths of these wrinkled of these kernels, sorry. And yellow and wrinkled should be one sixteenth of these kernels. So I can make a hypothesis now that says, looking at my corn, that I should have nine out of 16, or nine sixteenths should be purple and smooth. Three sixteenths should be purple and wrinkled, three sixteenths should be yellow and smooth, and one sixteenth should be yellow and wrinkled. Don't know if you can read that from where you are, but at least you can hear me say it. All right, so the next trick is to add, count all of these corn kernels. You can see there's quite a few corn kernels. Ideally, if you were doing this in class, you would make a mark on end of one row, count all of the kernels that are purple and smooth, record it, count all the kernels in that same row that were purple and wrinkled, record it, count all the kernels that are yellow and smooth, and then finally count all of the kernels that are yellow and wrinkled and record it for each row of corn. It's a lot of corn on one cob. I've done that for you already, so you don't have to do it yourselves. And here is the tally sheet. As you can see from the tally sheet, there's quite a few kernels on a corn, ear of corn. As a matter of fact, it totals out to 569 kernels on one ear of corn. My tally said that there were total, I'm just gonna go over the totals, 324 of the 569 that were purple and smooth. 95 out of the 569 were purple and wrinkled. 109 out of the 569 were yellow and smooth. And only 41 out of the 569 are yellow and wrinkled. So these are my total numbers observed. Well, how many should I have expected to get out of 569? So that would be my expected ratio. To determine that, I go back to my original genetics and I said that 9 sixteenths of them would be purple and smooth. So 9 sixteenths of 569 is 320. That's a difference of four. 95 observed purple and wrinkled, how many should I have gotten? 
if it was following genetics the way I expected, I expected 3 sixteenths of the 569 to be purple and wrinkled. So that would be 107. The difference between 95 and 107 is negative 12. On the yellow and smooth, I expected 3 sixteenths of the 569, which would be 107. I observed 109 with a difference of two. On the yellow and wrinkled, I expected 1 16th of the 569, which would be 35. I observed 41 for a difference of six. What do I do with these numbers? Statistically, I can compare my expected and my observed ratio to determine if I'm within the level of chance whether the deviation from my expected is due to chance or if it's due to something else, something else that's happening. If it's due to chance, we call that our null hypothesis. Our alternate hypothesis is that something else is causing the deviation from the norm. To do that, we use a chi-square. And a chi-square, the symbol looks like this. It's a very complicated looking formula, but it's really not difficult at all. Instead, when you do chi-square, the symbols mean this is the sum of observed minus expected, subtract them first, then square that, divide it by the expected value, and hold the number for each one of those. In this case, we have four. When you're done, add them up and get the sum, and you will have observed minus expected squared add them up for the sum, and that is called your chi-square value. So I'll show you one at a time so that it makes sense. You'll notice the data comes from above. Here is our purple and smooth. So we observe 324. I like to make a chi-square table like this, by the way, and I teach my students to do it as well. It just makes it easier to follow your thinking. As you get used to doing chi-square, you might have, not have to make a table each time. You could just remember how to do each step. But as you're learning chi-square, it's a good idea to use a table to keep track of what you're doing. So the observed from up here was 324. Our expected from right here was 320. The difference is four. Square four, and you get 16. 16 divided by this 320 is 0.05. Moving down one more. Purple and wrinkled. We observed 95. We expected 107. 95 minus 107 squared is 144. You lose the negative value once you square something. 144 divided by 107 is 1.35. The next row. Yellow and smooth. We ex counted 109. We expected there to be 107. The difference between the two is two squared is four. Four divided by 107 is 0 0.04. Last row. I'm sure you can see where I'm going with this. Yellow wrinkled, we observed 41. We expected 35. The square the difference between the two, which was six, and you get 36. 36 divided by 35 is 1.03. The last step of my chi-square, I've done all of the observed minus expected for all four phenotypes, and the last step is to add. So I'm going to now add those up, and I get a value of 2.47. 2.47. So what does this value mean? This is called a critical value in chi-square. And when you look at a critical value, you have to compare it to a chi-square table. When comparing to the chi-square table, there's something you need to know first, and that is the degrees of freedom. I'm going to turn the page and hope that you can see the chi-square table. I only wrote part of it because we didn't need to read that detail. This is the chi a chi-square table, an example of a chi-square table. So before we can use the chi-square table, we have to decide what level of confidence do we want to use and how many degrees of freedom are there? So the degrees of freedom, that's easy. Degrees of freedom is always one less than the number of possibilities. And we had how many possibilities? We had four, right? But what were they? They were purple and smooth, that was one. Purple and wrinkled is two. Yellow and smooth is three. And yellow and wrinkled is four, so that's four. Our degrees of freedom, therefore, would be 
three. So degrees of freedom would be three. The second thing we need to decide is at what level of confidence do we want to judge our answer? As you move across the chi-square table, it goes from a p-value of 0 0.9, 0 0.5, 0 0.2, 0 0.05, 0 0.01, and 0 0.001. In biology, we're usually pretty comfortable with looking at a p-value in the range of the 0 0.05, sometimes in the 0 0.01. For our purposes today, we're gonna to use the 0 0.05. And what that means, if I am using the p-value of 0 0.05, is that I'm 95% confident in my answer that it is either due to chance or it is not due to chance by deviation from the norm. So I'm looking at the deviation from what I was expecting, and this gives me a confidence of how, how likely it is to be due to chance or likely to be due to something else, some other cause. So we had a value just a minute ago. We had a first of all, degrees of freedom was three. I'm gonna bring this down again so you can see what was our chi-square calculated value. Our chi-square calculated value is 2.47. We're gonna apply that to the chi-square table. Chi-square tables are always provided for you when you're answering a chi-square problem. So I'm gonna to go to degrees of freedom of three. I'm gonna use the p-value of 0.05, which is right here, and I see the number 7.815. So any number that is 7.815 or higher means that if my calculated critical value, I should say, which ours was 2.46, if my critical value is higher than 7.815, it means that I reject the null hypothesis. That means that whatever happened to my situation or my scenario is not due to chance. There's something else that's causing the change. Our value, critical value, was 2.46, which was decidedly less than 7.815, which means that any deviation that we saw is just due to chance. So we don't say that we accept our null hypothesis. Instead, we say we fail to reject it, which means I don't have enough information to know whether or not this is due to something else other than chance. It's just a random occurrence that these numbers did not match perfectly with what I was expecting. You can see, just at a side note, as I go across this table, those numbers get higher and higher and higher. Just if I look at the, P, the degrees of freedom of three, you can see that the numbers get higher and higher and higher. Well, that's because you're narrowing down how confident are you that your result was due to chance or perhaps due to something besides chance something else that contributed to the change that you saw, okay? So our value was 2.46, which is significantly below 7.815. Therefore, what the results that we saw were likely just due to chance. I hope that's clear. Next, I'm going to have you try to calculate chi-square using blood types. So we have blood types of humans, we have four. They do not follow the normal genetics because there are two that are dominant and one that's recessive. And you can also have an individual who has both dominant forms because this form is co-dominant. So we're not gonna do the Punnett square for this problem. What we're gonna do instead is look at a small population of people, of a thousand people, where the data was collected on their blood types. And this is what they determined was what they observed was for blood type O, out of the 1,000 in the population, there were 400 people who were blood type O. There were 410 that were blood type A. There were 130 that were blood type B, and, and 60 that were blood type A. By national population standards, looking at the number of expected out of 1,000, they would have expected 450 to be blood type O, uh, o is recessive, but it's also very common in the, in the uh, human population. So A, 410. B, what they expected was 110. And A, B, they expected to see 30. I'm going to give you a few minutes to see if you can calculate first the deviation. So what's the deviation, the difference between these two? The observed and expected, observed and expected, observed and expected. And then I'm going to ask you to take a moment to do a chi-square as well. You can use the table that I used before. Here is the critical value. Again, we have one, two, three, four 
different blood types. So our degrees of freedom would be three. We're gonna stick with this value of 7.815. If your value is below that, you fail to reject your null hypothesis and what you see is most likely due to chance. If your number is higher than 7.815, it's likely there's some other contributing factor that makes us not follow what our expected ratios would be. So I'm gonna give you a moment just to pause the video. Come on, pause the video. It's your turn. You don't wanna just watch me do the work. I'll give you a minute. Go ahead and pause the video. Assuming that you paused the video, now I'm going to put up here the chi-square calculations for the blood type. Let's see how you did. So this was our observed again from our previous table. The blood type O was 400, A was 410, B was 130, AB was 60. The expected was based on national norm or international norms. 450 of O, 410 of A, 110 of B, and 30 of AB. Once we do the calculation, this comes out to be a giant number, right? 400, 400 minus 450 squared is 2,500. 410 minus 410 is easy, that's zero. 130 minus 110 squared is 400. 160 minus 30 squared is 900. Take the observed minus expected, the 2,500 divided by the expected. Over here you have 5.56. Zero, of course, divided by anything is zero. 400 divided by 110 is 3.64. 900 divided by 30 is 30. When I add those all up, I get a value of, critical value of 39.2. 39.2. Now let's compare that with our chi-square value that we were expecting. Up here, again, one, two, three, four values, four different types, four different choices. So our degree to freedom is one less than the number of possibilities, so therefore three again. So three, I want to scroll over to p-value of 0.05. Even if I go way out here, my p-value is still under 39.2. So because my critical value for my chi-square calculation is higher than, and I think you can see, can you see, I'm going to back it up. 39.2, as it says on the bottom, I'm gonna raise that because I don't know if you can see it. Hard to see what you can see. So 39.2 is my calculated chi-square value. 39.2 is significantly higher than 7.815. That which means that what is happening in this blood population, in this population of a thousand people, is not due to chance. So I can reject the null hypothesis that it is due to chance. Instead, there's something else that's contributing to this numbers not matching what we expected. It could be that there's immigration of people coming in. It could be that there's e-migration of people leaving. Most people want to say right away that it could be due to mutation. Sometimes that could be a correct answer. We can also have things that will distort our numbers on our genetics. Things like linked genes will distort those numbers. In core, Barbara McClintock won a Nobel Prize for just determining something called a transposon. I'll let you do some research and find out what a transposon are, um, a, or what a transposon is. It's just called a jumping gene, so that will give you some clue. I'm hoping that this helped you a lot to think about what happens with genetics and why do we do a genetic prediction. It also allows us to see how statistics are used to determine whether something is due to chance or whether it is due to some other influence that's affecting the genes. I hope you enjoyed this lesson. Thank you very much for attending.